uh, a, a couple of years after I did the Dimaxian vehicle. Now, when I did this Dimaxian vehicle, as a consequence of the automobile show, and then the real, real things, the crash, things were really settling down economically, and I, somebody said, I would like to back you, Bucky, you have a whole lot of ideas, and, and I really like to see some, uh, some things. The, the depression was completely on, and, and, uh, and somebody who had some money said, I like, you, you might just well have some uh, the money I have, because it, it, it seems to be everything just going away anyway, and maybe something you, you could, could develop would be worthwhile. So I, I, I said, I, I'll, I wrote a little simple, very simple contract. I said, if you let me, I can spend it all on ice cream and sodas if I want, then, then I'll take the money, but it must not say what it's going to do. It's not for profit or anything like that. And that turned out to be a very good contract later on. <laughs> the, because after things began to go, then everybody thought this person ought to make a lot of money and so forth, but we did not go into adventure. I was not trying to go in. I don't, I just don't get anywhere if you're going out to do things for profit. I learned that in the, in the, in those, in that housing world. <laughs> so, the, I went then to Bridgeport, Connecticut, where the, the this, uh, I went to Bridgeport, Connecticut, the day that Franklin Roosevelt declared the bank moratorium. It was just the day of his inauguration. And this person had given me money several weeks before, and I turned it all into cash. <laughs> and luckily, I had turned it all into cash. Instead of the bank moratorium, there was no no money anywhere. And I, I arrived in Bridgeport, Connecticut, was the only person in town not only with money, but my pockets full of it. And I went from being the most ineffective character that ever happened to suddenly being very attractive. And everybody wanted to work for me, so everything shut down. Nobody had any jobs, and I got part of the. Uh, this is in my building in due course. I got the old dynamometer building of the old locomobile automobile, which was a very great automobile in its day. And they, they'd gone absolutely bust, and, and the banks owned them. So they rented, rented me this building, which had been the dynamometer building. And, and it was out on a point of, of land in the, in the harbor, a very nice point. And in there, I produced the three Dimaxian cars. Also up in the front of it, you'll see a boat upside down. And I got Starling Bridges, who was a very great aeronautical, uh, a very great ship designer, but also um, an aeronautical designer, to come to, to, to along with me as as my engineer. A very extraordinary man, Starling. Starling, to anybody in in the in the sailing world knows all about it, but not so many other people do know of him. He did with a man named Dunn, who was a very great scientist in England, James Dunn, developed the Bridges Dunn airplane for the United States Navy in 1912, and it was the first hands-off landing ship, and it was the first Delta Wing. <laughs> that was the Delta Wing came in many years later, they suddenly went back and found the Bridges Dunn thing was, was it. But it, it, was, it was a plane where the pilot could literally take his hands off and it, it could land the, the seaplane without any, any trouble at all, self-landing. And then Starling designed, uh, he was there, if you know, in the yachting world, there was a the six meters and eight meters and the ten meters and the twelve meters are very well known. The twelve meters used in that. He invented all those classes of sailing boats and, and uh, designed the best of them. He also designed the last, the last three great J boats after World War II. The cost of boat building so went up that you had to race, race, race the twelve meters, which were pretty small boats. But the last of the really great big boats were the J boats. And Starling designed all three of those. Before him, his father. Edward Burgess had designed three American Second Successful Cup Defenders, and so it was a, very much a family tradition. He designed the Puritan, the Volunteer, and the Mayflower, and they all, they all beat, the, beat the English. And Starling Burgess, uh, Burgess's brother was the chief mathematician for the United States Navy's lighter-than-air structures, for, that's for all their zeppelins and things. He was a very extraordinary mathematician, very extraordinary kind of a family. Starling himself was very much a mathematician, and uh, uh, but a, a very eccentric man. He'd gone to the same school that I had, Milton Academy, quite a few years before me, and he was terribly interested in my ideas and Dimax in house and all, and he was very eager to work with me on, on my, my developing my vehicle. Because I said, I, one thing I, I, 
I don't have enough money being given to me to produce a Dimax in-house. That would cost really millions. I'd, I'd gone into that very clearly. Furthermore, I said I, I cannot possibly develop the new propulsion means. Therefore, what I will do, because the automobile world is producing all kinds of equipment that I can use, I can test the ground taxing qualities of my omni medium transport because the most dangerous phase of flying or shipping is when you hit the land, whether you hit a rock or whether it's contact with the, with the crystalline, because in the, in the air you're in, in a low distributing element. And once you launch your beautiful ship in the sea, all the loads are beautiful, hydraulically and pneumatically distributed. It's terribly safe, so you get a concentrated load of a rock or, 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 or a pier or another ship. So the most dangerous condition of, of flying is when you make contact with the Earth. I saw that with a completely streamlined vehicle, when I got on, on the Earth, because if you are a fly of a light plane, you know that she immediately, as she lands across the wind, she wants to head in the wind. And the old planes used to have a great deal of ground looping, it's called, and, and this very violent swinging around, maybe turned upside down, really often, often crack up a ship just after landing with the cross wind. So I said, with the kind of streamlining I'm going to get into, the fairing has to be absolutely superb. Therefore, she'll want to head into the wind. So if I'm going to, on the highway, I can't control the wind, so her ground taxing are going to be, how, can, how is she going to maneuver? What's going to happen? So I, I, I built this vehicle to test the ground taxing qualities of an eventual uh, omni-medium transport. I did not go into designing an automobile. <laughs> but it, here it was running on the ground. I had to get a license from the state to be allowed to take it out on the highway so that the, in the end, it was, everybody called it the Dimax in the automobile. And, and many people incidentally said to me, after I built three of these, I'm sorry your car wasn't a success. I said, what do you mean? I said, well, you didn't get in production. I said. <laughs> I wasn't going into business, I was producing a vehicle. <laughs> and, and it was extremely successful. I, I learned an incredible amount. And it actually has affected, it did affect the whole automotive world. They did learn many, many things from that car, I assure you. And it, and it did change a great deal of the grand strategies of, of the of, of automotive engineering. Now, it was an interesting vehicle in that it also, like the bird or the fish and so forth, the propulsion is up far abreast of the center of, of volume, the, the center of gravity, and so forth, and the steering is in the, in the rear. That's where a bird, that's where nature does its trick. She doesn't have the fear.